Okay. Um, yeah, so this is also not going to be a practical session. So there's just going to talk to end, uh, to end with. I uh, want to speak about image analysis, AI, and QPath. But to be honest, I think at this point in the day, you might be slightly sick of QPath. Um, so let's start with something a little bit different. Um, talk a bit more broadly about sort of image analysis and that kind of thing. We'll, we'll get to QPath in the end, but I, yeah, I figured at this stage, there's a strong chance QPath will have annoyed you at some stage or crashed or something. So let's um, start with something else for a little while. And so to begin with, I would like to start with the admission that, okay, so I created QPath a while ago um, and still maintain it. And I have been working in the field of bioimage analysis for about 18 years now. And I still find all of it incredibly difficult. Um, and I still don't feel like I know how to approach most problems. And I spent a lot of time chasing ideas that don't work. So just in case you find yourself working in image analysis and it, you think it's difficult, I think everyone finds it difficult. And if they don't, then I'm not, I'm not sure I trust them. Um, so yeah, because my impression is that image analysis is almost always harder than it looks. And even the stuff that seems like it should be simple, really quickly becomes complicated if you think about it enough. Um, and which is really infuriating if you're working on it, because often you're, if you're working with people who don't have to do the image analysis themselves, um, then they can just look at the picture and think, why can you not just detect and measure that? Um, but it's so much harder in reality. Uh, so I find it quite a, quite a nice field to work in because it's so visual and, and interesting and always these different challenges, but also infuriating because you're working with people who don't realize how difficult it is um, a lot of the time. And so I want to take an example of that. And so this is using standard image processing techniques. Um, so some of you may be familiar with them. I'll show some resources later if you want to learn about them. But basically the task here is that we want to count the cells in this image. And so in the world of biological and my microscopical image analysis, I think this is about the easiest kind of task that you can get. It's a fluorescence image, you've got um, nuclear staining, you're trying to count the cells. And so this is from the Broad Benchmarking data set. And so they helpfully provide some ground truth counts that manual observers have made. And you can see that looking at this field of view, um, one observer said 398 cells, one 500. 33 cells. So the manual counts were pretty different. Um, uh, and so it's, it's kind of hard to tell what the truth is, uh, or at least you can't rely on a human to be able to do it. So you would think that this sounds like a job for image analysis. We can do it objectively and we can really determine what the number of cells are within this field of view. And so we have nuclei here. They have got lighter pixel values and a darker background. So that means that we have higher values for the pixels. Pixels are just numbers, so higher values show lighter here. And so let's set a threshold. So I'll set a threshold here. And that gives us 367 cells. So it's looking pretty good for the first observer. Um, we get our automatic cell counts really fast. We set a threshold. We cluster all of the bright pixels together into distinct um, regions called objects, uh, count them together, and we get 367. But you don't need to look at it very closely um, to see that there's lots of nuclei being clustered together, clumped together. And so they're not, it's not great, but it was fast. Um, so then we might decide, okay, let's see if we can improve on this a little bit. And so there is a technique in image processing called the watershed transform. And the general idea in this case is that we find all of the pixels that have higher values than their neighbors. We use those as kind of seats and then expand them out until they would crash into one another. Um, and that basically helps to create, break up these clusters too good at it in some ways. Um, so now we've ended up with uh, 1,700 cells, over 1,700, because it's gone too far. Um, we've broken up the cluster too much. There was too many little maxima. Uh, and so with our watershed transform, we've got way too much. Um, so we need to tone that down a bit. So one way that we can tone that down is we start to average the neighboring pixels a little bit. And so a Gaussian filter is basically a little weighted average where you replace each pixel with the weighted average of the surrounding pixel values. It smooths out the image. And then whenever we do that, we don't have as many of these little local maxima. And so we end up with a more reasonable number of cells. It's starting to look better for counter number two, but we're still a lot higher than what they had got. 
And so we think, okay, we want to reduce the fragmentation a little bit more. So why do we not just do our watershed transform a little bit different? We don't take all of the, the little bright peaks, but only the bright peaks, which are brighter by a, a tolerance threshold. Um, so basically you don't need to worry too much about what this tolerance is, um, but it's just meaning that we're not getting, we're throwing out the little peaks, um, which aren't much brighter in their surroundings. We do that, then we're down to 530 cells. So we went from the beginning agreeing with the first observer to the end we're agreeing with more or less with the second observer um, just by adjusting the parameters. So it's looking promising, but there are still lots of errors because if you go back to the image, um, you can see that there's areas where we seem to maybe have missed nuclei or more often we might have merged a couple together. And so it's also a little bit questionable. But the important thing here is that We've got a simple application and we've chosen the simplest steps that I thought that could potentially work and we can get all of these different results. And if we adjust any of these parameters, if I use some fixed thresholds in there, if we adjust any of them, then we can get different results again. And so that's what I tried to show in this animation. So by adjusting um, these parameters, we can change the counts of the cells we get, we get the, we change the areas that we get, and then we get, we change the, the mean intensity. So all of our metrics have changed based upon the approach that we use to count the cells and the parameters we use with that approach. I find that a little bit disturbing in one of the easy cases, whenever that's possible. And that's just looking at one image. So imagine if we were to do that um, and think about, we have a whole uh, data set of images. In this case, there's only six that we can work with, but what if we change those parameters they will affect all of the images and maybe they'll affect them slightly different ways because some images might be brighter than the others and so it'll have a different impact than others. And so <laughs> our results when we apply them across the data set are influenced by the parameters that we choose. And we might choose the parameters looking at one or two images, images but not by all of them. And they often will impact the results in a systematic way. So it's not gonna be random. Um, it tends to be that if you increase the threshold, you'll detect fewer pixels, so your objects will get smaller, your mean intensities will get higher, um, you'll probably detect smaller objects, but it's even not quite that simple because of fragmentation and so on. And so there is a, a very much a non-random kind of influence whenever we adjust parameters. So you think, okay, we can improve this, we can make it more objective by trying to automatically set some of these parameters. So how about we automatically set the threshold? And there's lots of approaches. If you use MHJ, you can go to their threshold command and there's a list of maybe eight, nine, 10 different methods, like Otsu's method or um, um, the triangle methods. And we can go through them and we can generate a whole load of new results. And so the point of all of this is that even with a simple case, we have so many decisions that we have to make along the way whenever we're trying to get our analysis. I still don't know how many cells there are on my image. We know that humans don't agree, and we know that using automatic methods, we can get a load of different results depending upon the decisions that we make. So I'm kind of skeptical about image analysis, despite working in it and spending my career in it. I often don't know really how much we can trust it. And in particular, I don't really tend to agree with the thought that it's objective, or at least that it's unbiased if you do things in an automated way. Because somewhere, somewhere along the line, somebody has to make the decision as what are the parameters or what are the methods that we're going to use. And I find that um, kind of disturbing. And so you can really get more or less any results um, using automated methods. And so and the errors and biases, as I said, they're probably systematic. In addition, it's complicated because deciding if you've done something sensible it often requires knowledge from different fields. And so I know a bit on the sort of computational image analysis side, but I'm not a biologist or a microscopist, um, and I'm not a statistician or a, um, a real expert in machine learning. And so all of these different factors can feed into the results that we get. And each one of them has its own like assumptions and potentially risks. And the final results depends upon kind of understanding all of them, but it's rare that any individual does. So we need to be able to communicate with one another and kind of figure out a method that works together. And so I don't have a solution to any of this. Um, so I don't know how to do image analysis, right? I would say, so what I can really talk about in this presentation are attempts to help do some parts of image analysis less wrong. That's kind of my, uh, the goal of my, my career um, is to, yeah, try and progressively do things a bit less badly than I've been doing them the year before. 
Uh, and so I don't think it's hopeless because somehow science involving imaging works. Um, so it, it isn't totally hopeless, but it is difficult. It's really difficult. And it's more difficult the more you look into it. I don't think it gets an awful lot easier. But something that I've come to believe is particularly important is that the algorithms developed by researchers, so I, I think of myself as a researcher from the image analysis field. And so there's loads of image analysis publications um, presenting this exciting proof of concept method for whatever application. But what people actually do in practice is going to depend upon what's available to them in software. And I think that certainly in academia, there's too much emphasis on novel algorithms. But what is actually used is always filtered through the software. And that's only a very sub small subset of the algorithms that are um, supposedly available based upon the literature. So what interests me is thinking about how can we try and view these as equally important. Um, and one is not easier than the other. I think that the development of the novel algorithms on the research side can be difficult. The development of software is certainly not any easier. Um, if anything, I think it can be more difficult. And so I think that these should be viewed as equally important if we want to be able to progress more quickly. And so that's what I've tried to do within my career. And the third piece of this is that I think it's important to try and develop methods um, that are understood. Because as I said, that responsibly analyzing images um, in biology requires in knowledge from different domains, and it's rare that anybody masters all of them. And so I feel that the most that I can do from my side is to try and be as open and transparent about the methods that I'm using, particularly if other people will, will be applying them, so that the person who understands the biological experiment can also understand the methods that I have um, developed and given to them. And so I think that all these thing, three things need to work together. So now that I have a research group at the University of Edinburgh, um, we work on developing new image analysis algorithms and approaches. We work on making them accessible through open source software, in particular QPath, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. And we work on um, trying to explain the concepts of what we're doing, um, explain also the techniques and the limitations because all of our stuff is open source. So we're not trying to sell it to anyone. If you don't want to use it, that's fine. If you do want to use it, then that's great. Um, but yeah, we're not trying to convince you that our methods are the best. What we want is that we present these methods and we want you to understand them and then to be able to decide if they're appropriate for your um, application. So that's what we, we try and do with our work. And so none of this makes any sense whatsoever without collaboration and sharing, because there's no point us developing methods um, that we don't apply because we are not the biologists, we're not the pathologists. Um, and yeah, but we, we want to contribute as freely and openly um, the part that we, we can understand um, so they can be put together to do interesting things with uh, people who know stuff that we don't. And we can't guarantee that our methods are right for any application, but we can try to be open about what they do. And so in the rest, of the rest of this presentation, I want to begin by saying a little bit about um, sort of image analysis handbook that I wrote uh, a while back. And so it's appeared a couple of times in this presentation or in earlier presentations. So I want to speak a bit about that. I um, want to speak then about QPath, of course, and then speak about what's next, particularly with uh, future QPath developments. And so my own personal background in image analysis uh, is that my, my degree was a completely different direction. My degree was in theology, and then I, I needed to do something else. I ended up doing a master's in computer science, applied for a job in the industry. They didn't want me, so I ended up in a PhD by accident. Um, and so, and it was with a biology group. And they figured they could teach me the biology. They just needed someone who could do the, figure out the image analysis. So I, a year of computer science, I didn't really know much about image analysis. Turned out they were overly optimistic, thinking they could teach me a lot of biology. And it also turned out that they had a lot of image analysis problems and a lot of people in the lab. So it was pointless for me to be in the lab messing things up. So I ended up specializing fully on the image analysis throughout my PhD. And this was working on um, confocal microscopy images of retinal arterioles and developed some retinal image analysis software along the way. But the thing that really shaped my career after that um, was my first postdoc was at Heidelberg University, where I was an image analysis specialist in a core microscopy facility. And that really opened my eyes to the world of, there are so many projects that need image analysis. And it's very, very hard um, to solve the problems, but they somehow need to be solved quickly and efficiently enough um, because there's just so many of them. 
So if I approach that with a PhD mentality, if I'm spending three or four years to come up with one or two algorithms that I can run and possibly one or two other people, if I explain them well enough, um, into within a few days or within a couple of weeks, we need to come up with a scientifically justified way of analyzing images for this study and then move on to the next study. And so that brought me into the world of using and adapting open source tools as opposed to spending a very long time developing one novel algorithm that would only be used by a very small number of people. And whenever I was in Heidelberg, one of the things that I, I realized is that, yeah, it's important that the responsibility for the image analysis doesn't fall through the gaps. So it doesn't land on me because I don't understand the biology well enough, and it doesn't land on the person who is understands the biology, but may not understand the techniques that I'm giving them or the, the algorithms or plugins um, that I'm giving them. So what I can try and do to address that is I can try to explain as clearly as possible the principles of image analysis for the people that I'm working with so that they understand more of my world and I understand just enough of their world so that together we can work effectively with them. And so that led to me thinking, well, maybe I can write up what I learned on image analysis. I figured I might stretch to 20 pages of something on the techniques that I use every day. Turned out that was a lot wordier than that, and I couldn't boil it down to that much. And so this ended up maybe like 150, 60, 70 page PDF. Because what I tried to do in writing this handbook in, in Heidelberg is try and give kind of the concepts of image analysis, but in a visual way, because it had taken me years to learn this stuff. And it wasn't reading pages of maths in image analysis textbooks that made a click. It was like having a picture in my mind of how it fitted together. So what I tried to do in this book is to, yeah, be able to create the, the pictures that help to explain what these concepts mean in practice. And so this brought in stuff like point spread functions and also noise from a fluorescent microscope, but also image filters and thresholds and watershed transfers and all that kind of stuff. So this was, this was explained in this book. And then more recently, um, I completely revised it and updated it. And so this is freely available online as an interactive um, book at this website that you can see, and it's under an open license as well. And so this, if you're interested in the principles of image analysis, um, is, is available to try. So what you can see here is that I've tried as much as I could to make it an interesting thing to read and to make use of the fact that it's online. Um, so there's videos that explain concepts. So here, concepts of lookup tables and it shows interactively how they work um, and how you can change the appearance of an image without changing the pixel values. But as well as describing the concepts, um, well, there's another concept one actually, this is on um, automated thresholds and how they work. But I also have practical chapters showing how these concepts relates to the open source software ImageJ. Um, which has been around longer than QPath and is much bigger than QPath. Um, so this, this is what the software that I use for teaching. In addition, I've embedded questions within it so that as you're reading it, if you want to test whether you understand the concepts, um, you can read this question and then get the answer. And so it's to try and keep the reader engaged and understand if they, well, uh, to recognize whether or not they really understand what's going on. And there's also embedded practicals um, using this fantastic thing called uh, imjoy or imagej.js, where you can click a button within the website and it will open up an embedded version of imagej within your browser and it will open up the images that you need to answer the question. And so you can explore within the browser um, again whether or not you understand the concepts. And then, because the concepts of image analysis aren't really unique to any particular software, um, I also uh, wrote this book so that you can use Python as well. So lots of data scientists and researchers use Python for image analysis. It's kind of hard to make a user-friendly software in Python, um, but it's really nice to explore data with. But the book is written using Python to generate all the figures. So you can actually access the code to generate all the figures. You can adapt it live in your browser and you can change the, um, the way the figures appear within the book by using that code. So you can use the book also to learn, you can learn the concepts, learn MHJ and learn Python. Uh, there are some video lectures. Um, so this was part of an in-person course that I used to teach. And so I started to record the video lectures for it. Um, I thought that I would have them finished and I've so far only managed to do one of them, but these should be online uh, one day. Okay, so, 
so yeah, my, my focus in Heidelberg, or at least my conviction at the time was that, yeah, I, I'm not going to learn all the, it's not efficient for me to try and learn the biology of all the studies I work on. What's more efficient for me is to try and explain the stuff that I um, know a bit about to a large number of people, and then slightly counterproductive, because then they'll know what they know, plus what I know, and I'll only still know what I know. Um, but I'm hoping that it's it's going to be more effective um, mm -hmm. for, for their projects, and hopefully I'll still manage to keep a job um, somehow. Uh, but I came to realize that learning image analysis concepts and techniques isn't really enough, at least not for me, because I still don't feel like I know how to analyze images when I encounter a new project, because I'm um, contending with all of these worries that I showed before, where what impact will it make if I change these parameters? I know it will make a difference, but I don't know exactly how I should change them to be sure that I'm right. Um, but in addition uh, to that, to that fact, is that if you're even going to apply the techniques and concepts of image analysis, you need software. Um, because there's no point knowing them if you've no way to actually apply them to the images and see what happens in the end. And so that's really what shaped my, my second postdoc um, whenever I returned to Belfast um, and I entered the field of digital pathology. All I really knew at the time is that there were images and they were big. Um, but yeah, so it was a quite a different world for me to try and figure out what was going on with that. And, and I entered it with the kind of, so I, I started the postdoc in Heidelberg with the PhD mentality that I can spend three years in a project and then discover that I couldn't because we needed results in three weeks. And then I started this um, second postdoc thinking, well, I can use all the open source tools that I learned from my costume and apply them to digital pathology. And then I find that I couldn't because they couldn't even open the images because a single image is um, typically about 40, 50, 60 gigabytes in size. And so even if you cropped all the white space out there, it would still be about 15 gigabytes of raw data for a single image. And I couldn't open it. Um, so this was back in about 2000, the very end of 2012. And so I spent um, the first two years of my postdoc writing terrible software. So I wrote um, a kind of a Python-based parallel processing framework that no one has ever used since and probably never should use since. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so this was to try and sort of break up an image into different pieces and apply some sort of analysis to it. And then, but it never really put it together uh, in a very nice, easy to interpret way. So you would get some results, but if you wanted to work with a pathologist and they would check if the results are, are any good, that was going to be quite difficult because there was no real interactivity to it. And I also created some image day plugins that could do some tasks like the arraying of tissue microarrays and cell detection. Um, but again, they were quite hard for people to use. But they, I think they were publishable because at the time there wasn't even these things or else I wouldn't have created them. Um, but ultimately then I um, started to, to work on the task of maybe I could create a way of viewing these whole slide images. And if I could start to embed some of these techniques within a whole slide viewer, um, then maybe there would be a way to bring it together and actually make it user-friendly and usable. And so that is what ultimately led to creating Cupa. So this is a really early version of it from before it was um, formally released, but you can already sort of see it's a little bit recognizable. The user interface was written in a completely different way, um, an old uh, Java technology, uh, which has replaced by Java FX since then, but you can still see it's the same sort of idea. Um, and what I find is whenever I started to create this new software, first day I thought that wasn't gonna work. And I think at about one day before the holidays, and I thought, well, I'll give it a go. I'll try, try creating a new whole slide image viewer and it probably won't work and I'll do something else after the holidays. And as far as I can remember, it started to look like it worked by the end of the day and it kind of ruined the holiday then um, because it became quite exciting because I find as I started to create new software, it gave the opportunity to think about things in a new way. I no longer had to adapt my ideas for how to analyze images to what ImageJ could do or what um, maybe Cell Profile or Python or anything else could do. I had the chance to think about the images differently. And so that's why QPath, it has some quite different characteristics to, if, if you know ImageJ, it works in quite a different way, which has advantages and disadvantages. And I still use ImageJ myself all the time, um, but I, yeah, it has some advantages for the applications it's designed for. So one of these is the QPath is object-based. So you've heard the word object mentioned a few times throughout the day. Um, and the basic idea is that an object is something in your image which is 
interesting. So it's like an incredibly general term. So objects have regions of interest. So it could be like a contour around a cell. It could be a contour around a gland or a vessel or a piece of tissue or whatever. It's a, a very general idea. But as well as defining some region in the image, it can have measurements associated with it and it can have classifications associated with it. And these objects are arranged in a hierarchy. And that means that you could have like objects which are inside other objects or um, and that gives you a way of representing the data. In the early days, this hierarchy was really strict. Nowadays, you can often ignore it in QPath because it tries to not bother you too much with it. Um, but the data is at least, the contents of your image can be represented in this hierarchical way of objects inside objects. Um, and the goal in creating QPath is that working with these objects would then become faster and intuitive. So the challenge is you go to your image and you have to somehow manage to generate this object representation. But if you have it, then you can start to do interesting stuff with it. You can apply machine learning to classify your objects um, and you can uh, query them, like count them up, look at their measurements, um, see where they are in relationship to one another. And so then once you've built this object re representation, lots of things become easy, um, which otherwise in other software at the, for working with images would be really difficult. On the other hand, if you want to work with pixels in, in, in QPath, it's probably harder than an image day because QPath can't assume that you can read all of the pixels in the image. Um, and it was mentioned a couple of times that you can't change the image contents in QPath. And that's partly, partly so that you can't compromise the data, but it's also mostly just for the practical reason of your image is 60 gigabytes. You don't want to be able to modify that and have to duplicate your 60 gigabyte image, or it's just going to create a massive computational headache. So whenever you're working with pixels in QPath, you tend to work on small regions and then convert them into objects and then forget about the pixels again. And that's what enables the software to work in a, in a fast and intuitive way. So the big task is you go from the pixels to the objects, then you work with them, query them, and so on. And for that reason, QPath doesn't try to replace other popular tools. It just gives a different approach. OK, so I'll very quickly then show um, just a three-minute video of QPath in action. So it's not going to be anything too different from what you've seen already, but it'll show some of the, the tricks and shortcuts. I created a project by dragging an empty folder on top. I import the um, three images by dragging them on top. And here I'm showing annotation tools in order to be able to annotate um, tissue regions. So the goal of this video is to show three types of analyses within three minutes. And a few seconds because I got, I clicked the wrong thing around, around uh, along the way. Uh, okay, so here we have the brush tool, um, which you can see in action. And here we have the wand tool. And so the wand is quite satisfying when it works, quite infuriating when it doesn't, but it is satisfying when it works. Um, and so sometimes it can help to switch between the different tools. And here we can generate the measurement table and then we could get the, the measurements of the, the different pieces of tissue there pretty quickly. But of course you don't necessarily want to have to draw around everything that you're, you're gonna to want to measure. So in this case, we want to say quantify the area that's the in brown. And so I've given just a couple of examples and I'm interactively then training a machine learning classifier based upon those couple of examples. And it will then classify all the pixels in the image according to whether they're more like the brown sample I gave it or the, um, the non-brown sample I gave it. But we don't really want to get the area as a proportion of everything in the image. We want to, as a proportion, the brown area as a proportion of the actual tissue. So then I give an extra class in order to be able to say, this isn't even tissue, so just completely disregard this. Um, and so as a result, then we are able to get this sort of three class. So red is um, was the original brown area, blue is tissue, and then transparent in this case is everything that's not brown or tissue. But within QPath then it was automatically giving you the percentage measurements just by, if you drew a rectangle, it will give you all the measurements just for free with no extra effort. So QPath tries to make these things really easy. Um, it tries to make some things really easy once they're a well-defined workflow. If you go off script, um, it might still be a little bit harder, but over time, hopefully that will improve. And this final example is another T67 one. Um, you've seen the image before. I've run QPath cell detection. It's generated a load of different measurements, about 44, I think, different measurements per cell. You can visualize them as a heat map. You could give you smooth measurements from the time whenever the dialogue wasn't broken and it turns up the right side, which it will do again in a week. Um, and then we can start to give examples of these, I think, are tumor cells, and these, I think, are non-tumor cells. 
and I can train then a classifier based upon these 44 different measurements per cell and the examples I've given it. And then now we have um, all within real time in the video, we have um, detected our 80,000 cells or so, calculated 44 measurements, actually added to those measurements a little bit, given a couple examples, trained machine learning classifier, and then we can find areas of high densities of positive tumor cells and create hotspots or um, regions from those if we need to. And so all of those techniques, I guess you're going to be seeing, well, some you've seen before, others you'll see in the next couple of days, but they can all be done um, in QPath. And this is, yeah, it took about a minute or so to, to generate that. Metadata. So QPath aims to be open. Um, it tries to make analysis transparent and verifiable. So can't guarantee that it's necessarily going to be right, but it should make it possible to visualize what QPath has actually done. Um, and so you can look at it and you can say that, well, it's those cells really, are, what is calling a cell really is a cell, or you can say that it isn't. And QPath can't guarantee you that it is a cell, but what it can try and do is to make sure that it shows you what it thinks is a cell, and then you can make the judgment as to whether or not it's right. And if it's not, you can adjust the parameters and then hopefully improve it. Um, but hopefully it will be right enough um, most of the time. Tries to be flexible. Um, so something that I think is quite important is that to try and get a single solution to solve many problems, as opposed to trying to approach every problem as something that develops, yeah, it takes six to 12 months and it's a whole new paper. Um, try and come up with one, the building blocks of lots of different algorithms and solve these building block problems lots of different ways. So cell detection is one of them, cell classification is another. And by giving you those building blocks, they can be combined flexibly to solve lots of different things. And QPath tries to be user-friendly as well. Um, my goal or hope is that the hard part of analysis should be defining the scientific question that you want to answer, and you shouldn't have to wrestle it from the software. I think that probably this is kind of in order of importance as well. So user friendliness, I think is really important, but I think flexibility is kind of more important because it would be really user friendly if you just press a button, and get a result, but it, if, if it's not a result that's meaningful for you, then it's kind of pointless. So I think flexibility is slightly more important and openness is really crucial to QPath. Um, because that enables lots of additional things. So we try and improve all of those, but this is kind of the, the order of importance. Um, and so I created with this in mind, um, particularly I wanted an open source tool for digital pathology because at the time there weren't really, there wasn't really anything out there for, for this kind of work. Um, Probably not the time to go into a lot of detail about it, particularly if this is being recorded and streamed, but yeah, it was a difficult path to get it available involved leaving two jobs along the way. Um, eventually, it did end up being available open source because of leaving those two jobs. Um, turned out journals didn't care anyway, so it got six desk rejections, and so wasn't looking too promising um, at that stage. But I mean, I still thought it was the, the right thing to do, um, and I still thought that it could be useful. And well, uh, in the end, it has become quite a lot bigger. Um, so it's had over 410,000 downloads across all the different versions. Um, there's been workshops and there's about over two and a half thousand citations of the paper at the moment. There's places where it's used and it's not cited, but there's also citations where it's um, not necessarily used. Um, so that gives you some sort of idea as to um, the use of it. And I'm finding it's about um, two and a half new papers a day this year, just on, on average, every day this year. And so the rate is increasing. And so we've got a, a sense that it is used pretty widely. And um, that's slightly reassuring that it was in some sense worth it. Um, so yeah, there is then the Scientific Community Image Forum, which I think you'll hear more about whenever Mike talks about it, if Mike's going to talk about it. Um, but yeah, so there's about 40 or 50 different open source projects there. And my stats, this is slightly out of date. Mike showed you er more up-to-date ones earlier. So it's well over 3,000 um, discussions about QPath. I think it's about 20,000 or more posts, um, individual posts about it, but it's over 3,000 separate topics. So I think it's closer to 3,500 now. And of all of the software on the uh, on the forum, QPath is one of the most frequently discussed just behind um, ImageJ and Fiji in recent times. And ImageJ and Fiji are huge. Um, Never expect to come anywhere close to them, but QPath is kind of the next one in terms of the frequency of discussions, which I thought was encouraging, although I did mention to a colleague and she said, well, it could just be the people who understand it's too confusing. Um, so 
Yeah. <laughs> Could go either way, but I'm still I'm putting that in grant reports and stuff as, as a good thing. So I think it might be the most way to use image analysis software for digital pathology, but I don't really know. I just, we don't track users. So I just did Google Scholar hits of software that I could think of the name of, but I won't mention the name of it here. And um, QPath has certainly uh, increased. Um, and so it does seem to be widely used, which is no doubt in large part because it's free, but I certainly hope that there are other reasons for it too. Um, and it's reassuring for me, and this was, I, Sure, in all my presentations um, in recent years, probably this was the the encouraging part for me after all the desk rejections and stuff. Is that whenever David Rim's lab at Yale um, they published in two thousand eighteen a comparison of QPath with other software and they uh, for key success analysis, and they find that the uh, they were essentially indistinguishable. But the thing is, that QPath was the only free and open source one, and the others were proprietary systems. And so it's reassuring for me that through this study, QPath was at least as good as the others. And so you may use it because it's free, but I would hope that you would use the best tool for the job, whether or not that's QPath. And it's reassuring to think that that might at least sometimes be QPath. Um, anyway, so I want to say a little bit about how QPath then relates to AI. So AI is like all uh, the big topic in computational pathology and bioimage analysis at the moment. Um, I guess, yeah, interest of time, I won't say too much about this. So some things that you will certainly see tomorrow, if you haven't really seen so much today, um, except in the three minute video, is that um, you've got this machine learning in QPath. So AI and machine learning, we can consider them to be the same sort of thing at the moment. Um, AI is kind of the broader field, machine learning is how you do it. Um, so machine learning, we can see with that interactive training of pixel and object classification, so that's an example of AI that's been in QPath since the start. What's often meant now whenever people talk about AI is really deep learning, which is like a subset of techniques um, which are particularly powerful, um, but also can't so easily be trained interactively, or at least generally they require larger amounts of data and training on uh, graphics cards and stuff like that. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it's harder to build a, a deep learning classifier, but QPath, has been designed or redesigned in the last few years in order to be able to replace all of the interactively trained machine learning classifiers with deep learning ones if the application justifies it. And so I think the deep learning is quite exciting and Thibaut will show some examples. So Thibaut is a PhD student that works um, with me. And so he will show some yeah, examples um, which I think are looking pretty exciting where we've got a cell detection based upon deep learning, which um, uh, should hopefully in the future be an alternative to QPath cell detection. So deep learning is exciting and QPath does support it, albeit not as well as it will do in the future. Well, here's an example of that in action. So QPath pixel classifiers are quite good with color um, and perhaps a little bit texture, but here is a deep learning classifier, which is running through QPath um, to segment prostate epithelium using um, I used a public data set and I trained my own deep learning model in order to be able to segment prostate epithelium. And this is it appearing in QPath just the same way as any other pixel classifier I showed before. Um, and here's an example where I've also trained a, a for invasive breast cancer detection. This is again using a public data set, um, which tries to detect invasive breast cancer at a low resolution. So that's why it's quite fast in these big areas. And so in training these, I don't know if they are the best classifiers, but I just wanted to show examples of these are deep learning models running live through QPath, but they have the benefit of the work within the whole slide viewer. You can then zoom in, you can view them at high resolution. You can see exactly what they're doing. If you don't like QPath's cell detection, you can switch it with a deep learning version of it. Um, so just before the pandemic, I met one of the developers of Stardust at a conference. I really liked his method. And so I went back and I developed a QPath extension to implement it. The method's called Stardust and here's an example um, so you can download and run this extension if you want. It tends to give much nicer shapes of nuclei than, than QPath. Um, sometimes the results may be better, uh, but yeah, it takes longer to run. So there can also be reasons why you may prefer the original. And so here's an example of a difficult image with QPath's pretty unconvincing nucleus contours. And um, here's Stardust's much prettier nucleus contours. Um, and so, yeah. 
The benefit is that you can run either through QPath because QPath gives you the building blocks and you can choose the ones that you want and the ones that you need for your application and piece it all together. Stardust on its own is only going to, to detect nuclei, but if you put it in QPath, it can also expand the nuclei to approximate the cell areas. You can make measurements of them. You can fit it into a machine learning pipeline. So basically putting them together is something more powerful um, than either on their own. So that's an example of that here. And then one of the things I think is going to be particularly important in the future is starting to layer these things together. So here's my deep learning model for prostate epithelium segmentation and my Stardust model for nucleus identification. I can feed through the classification um, from the, the prostate model in order to be able to classify the cells. And so that's an example of using two different, completely different deep learning models running through QPath, feeding into one another in order to um, create, again, a result that you couldn't get with either alone. And so that's possible because QPath supports scripts and extensions. And so I said the openness is really the top priority. Um, and openness is not just it's free, um, as in you don't have to pay for it, but it's open as in the code is there. You can adapt it, you can add to it, you can integrate new things. And that's what I think is particularly exciting because the openness is more than um, it doesn't cost any money. And a, a few months ago, I started to see on Twitter that um, Someone who I'd never met um, was an integrated meta AI segment anything model. So this was a, a very popular thing in computer vision literature for a while. Um, well, I guess it still is popular, but it was a like, big news in um, in the field for for some weeks. And so they had integrated into QPath, and I wasn't entirely sure how they'd done it. Um, and I really only my only source of information about it was on Twitter because I wasn't at that conference. Um, but then. I went and looked and I checked out the code and I could see that they had done some really nice stuff on the, on the Python side to be able to link it up. And I figured, oh, there's actually some stuff in QPath that we can use in order to be able to um, embed this more nicely. And so I, I submitted a pull request. So that basically means I contributed some extra code to this extension on the QPath site um, so that they could talk together e in an even nicer way than before. And then they, uh, kindly accepted the pull request, and so we ended up, um, yeah, contributing to this new version of the of the extension. And so here is running within QPath, so here um, we're able to use uh, this extension in order to annotate in a new way. So it could be that we just draw a rectangle what, what we want, or we could just do a single click in order to be able to annotate different structures. And so this, um, what I was thinking whenever it was so making the suggestions for how to implement it is to do something a little bit like the wand tool. So it uses the zoom and the magnification that you're at, and it uses the color information within the image, sends this off to the AI model, and then is able to then create the segmentation. We have guinea pigs, so I thought it would be nice to try it with them as well. So it's pretty agnostic to the type of image that you've got. And so here we switch back to another, and this is again just using the same um, segmentation model. And so we can annotate it in in a way, it's quite satisfying um, whenever it works. And so here, if I zoom in, I think I'm going to then try it on individual nuclei as well. So depending upon how you adjust things in QPath Viewer, you can annotate quite different structures without really having to change anything in your approach. Um, which And so here, yeah, I switch to visualize a different marker, and then that can help us to uh, annotate. And so I have a, there's a visiting researcher in my group, Hal, and so he's working on the microscopy, and so I'm trying to learn more about what that is. Um, and so he's annotating, uh, yeah, lots of axons. And so, yeah, I think he's, he may find the, the task more pleasant using this um, segment anything model. So this is how it looks whenever we apply it here. And so I think there's, Going to be a little bit of time on day three when I could talk about this other deep learning project. There's a collaboration with um, Joel Saltz's group at Stony Brook University, where we have recently created another QPath extension using deep learning um, for computational pathology applications. So then, what's planned for QPath 0.5 and beyond? So you now have the release candidate of 0.5, but what's become pretty clear is that there will certainly be another release candidate or some changes because a, a few. Um, bugs have, have appeared. And so this was released on Friday afternoon um, in quite a sleep deprived state, needing to get on the flight to come here on Saturday morning. So um, you really have the absolute most, uh, you had the most <laughs> recent version of it, except for the changes that I made on the plane. Um, so yeah, it's close to the 
the latest. Um, so yeah, when I say what's planned for it, a lot of it you can already start to use. So the exciting sort of backdrop to this is that QPath finally has multi-year funding. Um, so yeah, whenever I left the job to get it released, um, I spent a year when I wasn't permitted to update it. And so I couldn't even fix bugs during that time. And so I left that job and was unemployed. So it had no funding and I had no job. Um, then I started a new position in Edinburgh where it was just me. And then I got funding for nine months and then Melbourne joined. And then we got funding for 12 months. So Melbourne stayed Then the pandemic came. So he, he got to stay a little bit longer, but then finally now we have funding for a longer period of time. Um, and uh, yeah, so Fiona is now here as, as part part of this. So we have um, funding from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and from the Wellcome Trust. And so these have got two kind of different focuses. Um, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is really to maintain and support the software as it is. Uh, whenever I mentioned the number of downloads and it's tens of thousands of downloads, tens of thousands of downloads per release. And so that's a lot to do to support because we basically have to function as the entire software development team, but also the support team as well. Um, then, yeah, so it's a lot to do. So this is focusing on maintaining the software, supporting the users, and um, trying to improve it uh, over time. Whereas the Welcome Trust Grant allows us to step back and then think more long-term about what new things need to be created or what things um, would we have done, should I have done differently if only I'd known better whenever I was writing things um, way back uh, years ago initially. And so, Part of the Welcome Trust Grant is going to be looking at QPath for maybe 3D images or time series and, and more complex data sets that we currently can support. Um, but the Chan Zuckerberg is focusing on our current applications and we get to try and um, work on those in parallel together. So some of the things that we've been working on recently, Fiona has spoken about user um, experience. One of the things that we, we discussed um, quite a bit is trying to improve this uh, the way of handling color channels for multiplex images, which was quite um, challenging. So there's some, if you know QPath from before today, then hopefully you will see there are some improvements to the way um, you can manage color channels. And then there's this um, help uh, thing, which I, I hope will become more useful over time. Um, Leo is the person who did most of the work on developing the new log viewer. And so the log viewer, it might not be the most glamorous tool for a user, but it's actually phenomenally useful because if you find the bug then and you post about it in the forum you can be pretty sure that the first question certainly i'm going to ask is did you check the log is there any information there so these horrible long lists of texts that look incomprehensible are fantastically useful to be able to figure out where the bug actually is and be able to fix it so leo's log viewer makes it far easier to access the valuable information we need in order to be able to fix things and we've linked it up to the toolbar so you can see whenever there's log messages there that you might not otherwise have noticed because you didn't think to open the log. And so this, I think, is going to be a really useful thing for the project going forward. Um, Alan has done a something miraculous in getting this open slide library, which is how QPath reads some whole slide images. He's got it working on, on a Mac, on Apple Silicon, which I could never figure out how to do properly myself. And so he did this. I say miraculously because he did it without having a Mac. Um, or any direct <laughs> access to it. Uh, and so he yeah, somehow managed to figure all of this out. And so that means that QPath 0 0.5 actually does work on Apple Silicon, um, so the recent Macs, as well as working on um, Linux, Windows, um, and the Intel Macs as well. And so big thanks to him for that. And so that is going to really help in the future. Quite an exciting thing about OpenSlide is that it was a project that was kind of seemed to be quiet since about 2015, but it's alive again now. And there's going to be a new version of OpenSlide coming soon with DICOM support and stuff like that. So it's, it's quite exciting that we can we can now access all of that stuff thanks to this work. He's also been working on a new script editor, which hasn't made it into this release, um, but may well in a future release. And Timo is here. I'm not really going to speak about what he is going to do because he's going to speak about it himself. Um, but I can just set the background to the problem of, yes, we need to be able to segment cells within um, QPath for lots of different things. I showed that we have the built-in QPath cell detection. I showed that we've got Stardust and cell pose got mentioned earlier, which is another cell detection that exists in the form of an extension to QPath. But whenever you have these multiplexed images, Accurate cell segmentation is really crucial. 
because none of these is really ideal or perfect. Because what we need to be able to try and identify is the individual nuclei, but also then um, be able to quantify the expression of whatever markers and whatever channels um, within different cell compartments. And whenever the estimate of the cell boundary is incorrect or whenever nuclei are merged together, all of this can result in weird, impossible phenotypes and nonsense data downstream. So this, it's a very early stage in the pipeline and we need to get it as accurate as possible. And so he's working on improved methods for that. But something that is quite important is that we don't just want improved methods, which are perfect concept in some paper somewhere, but not accessible. We want them to be user-friendly and embeddable within software uh, and within QPath so that they can really be fit into meaningful analysis pipelines. And then Paolo, I mentioned um, and showed a little bit of one of his images for the um, electron microscopy. So we are working on developing these. And Paolo has done a lot of work using PT and Elastic because um, you don't have to use QPath um, just for working together. Um, so yeah, uh, he will use QPath in the future because we, we think we can come up with a nicer way to do it. Um, but yeah, his, his initial one is developed using PT and Elastic and um, there's a preprint online for that. And Laura has joined recently. So this work isn't in the new software yet, um, but she's working on new and intuitive methods for thresholding. I show how crucial the threshold can be and the automated threshold will give different results. And so she's exploring that in a bit more detail to try and come up with a, a good general purpose um, thresholding method that is easy to understand. Something that we've worked on a little bit, um, but is not yet ready and it's not totally clear how much we should do it is the ability to adapt QPath into different languages. Um, this is using automatic translation, so it may be nonsense. Um, but one of the ideas that we don't want QPath to insist that, yeah, we want to be as open and accessible for everyone that we can. Um, but yeah, whether or not this actually is wise or useful is unclear, but we want to make it possible to have community um, versions of the software in different languages if that's desired. So priorities for the future then is we want to make QPath simpler and more powerful, uh, which is a difficult balance to get. And that's from a user perspective and the developer perspective. We want to dive deeper into specific research applications. Um, so I still think of it, we are a research group developing image analysis algorithms. Um, and to do that, we need to work and really think deeply about specific problems because otherwise we'll come up with solutions um, aren't really solving any real world problem. Um, if we build based on some simplified model of what we think biologists want, we need to actually work deeply on the problems with the people who care about the results. Um, I think that's crucial for us to, to deliver something that's actually meaningful. But we also want to always move beyond some proof of concept and to try and generalize and validate our methods. And one of the things that makes me um, difficult or slow to collaborate with, as Yvonne, my wife, will um, be able to attest later, um, is that Whenever I'm working on a project, I tend to be thinking of, okay, what's the next 10, 20, 30 projects which are going to be similar? And can we solve them all at once as opposed to just solving for this one specific project? Because I think that that challenges you to come up with more interesting algorithms um, and more useful algorithms by trying to think, find the common threads and the common themes across different applications and different um, challenges. And so that makes it interesting and fun, but also difficult and perhaps slower to solve each individual problem better in the end. And also, I want to stubbornly prioritize usefulness over recognition. I said about losing two jobs, I discovered I can be quite stubborn. Um, I want to really maximize the usefulness of the software, not the user numbers. I do quote the user numbers because I feel like to be a bit sustainable, we need to show that people use it. Um, it doesn't really matter if we had 10 users doing incredible stuff, that would be fine. Um, so. I want the software to be useful and I want people to use it because they can do meaningful things with it. But if there was another 10 applications that they could use that would do exactly the same, then they may they can just use them. There's no reason why we should create QPath as an end itself. Um, there's nothing to gain from just increasing user numbers. It's the usefulness that matters. Um, in the assumption that my <laughs> Uh, yeah, center managers and bosses aren't going to be watching this. I, I think the priority shouldn't be publications as well. If we publish something, I want it to be because we have something to say or something um, that meaningful um, to deliver. So yeah, my goal is to try and navigate academia while sticking to our values and really prioritizing what I think is important. 
And with that in mind, um, I, my moderately controversial, or at least opinion that is probably not tactful to mention that often, is that making complex software, I think, is kind of easy, or is, at least it's easier than making simple software. Um, and Cube has this continual battle about it can get more complex really easily, and we're continually trying to not try and simplify it, and that's the big struggle. And I have the idea that if I write an algorithm, and if it's really hard to run, then that's valued as research. Um, because I can share the code and it's really complex and nobody will ever use it, they, they can't use it, um, but it looks impressive and maybe mathematical and no one will ever use it. But if I have exactly the same algorithm, I spend another six to 12 months making it user-friendly so it runs at the press of a button, then suddenly you're a software developer and that is somehow less valued than being a researcher. And I don't think it should be because I don't think the developing of the software is any easier. If anything, it's harder and it's often more work in order to be able to do this together. And so I've tried to stick with that, um, despite, uh, yeah, several conversations in my career that became near the senior people, yeah, did not think that it, software was research. And um, yeah, I think it's important um, and worthwhile to view them as equally important, the development, the implementation, and the development and the creation of novel algorithms. And so we'll try and stick with doing that, um, even if it makes things harder to publish and we keep getting less rejection. Uh, so, yeah, because I think the user experience really matters because software's existence determines whether image analysis is possible, but its design and its implementation determines whether or not it's actually going to be done well and efficiently. And so years ago, there was this project called ImageJ.JF, or ImageJFX, and it was aiming to be a better interface for ImageJ. And one of the things that they had in their frequently asked questions, because I assume that they had the, encountered the same mentality, um, the question about scientists are smart and they don't need pretty tools, they need tools that allow them to do complicated things fast, and their argument was that the tools scientists use should be as easy as possible to save them spending hours figuring out how to analyze the data, and if 10,000 biologists complete a task in 10 hours instead of 20 hours, the average salary of $10 per hour it saves a million dollars of research funds and user experience matters. And so, yeah, I find I spend a ridiculous amount of my time working on little details that might try and reduce um, the annoyance of people using the software um, and make them be able to do things faster. Um, but scaled up by the number of users, I think it ends up being um, a good uh, yeah, impact to, to effort ratio. So one thing that we're trying to do is to um, make it easier to see uh, how to use Cupa. So we have this kind of little help dialogue we hope to improve because I mentioned about the understanding being important. I wrote this handbook thing. I think that I would like um, QPath to not just give you a load of tools to analyze your images, but to sort of guide in best practice. I don't necessarily know what best practice is always. So that's where we need the community conversations to figure out what it is. But there's certain things I know are important. Like for example, if you're using QPath, you probably do on a project, otherwise you'll end up losing stuff. So this dialogue will then tell you, it can give you a warning that the project isn't open or the image type isn't set, and that could be important. Or if you're working with it and you think, well, I annotated stuff and I can't see it. Well, this can tell you that the annotations are hidden um, because of that little button in the toolbar and it'll give you the icon. So it's just trying to give you little bits of help as you get started that if something is surprising you, it's probably worth pressing that button in case it already tells you why. And so that's one of the things that we've been um, trying to do is to yeah, make the software help you more. Um, we want to work on developing new algorithms. We want to develop them thoughtfully. And so if I can return briefly to the, the thing that I started off with, where I showed that the parameters could change everything um, for this cell counting. If I adjusted the threshold, I would get different counts, different intensities, different sizes. Well, if you actually go to QPAS cell detection algorithm, which I guess I wrote maybe 2015, 2016, but I was still thinking about these things at the time. And so if I apply QPAS cell detection in here, um, we can see a threshold of one, we get 497 cells. Threshold of five, 496 cells. Um, threshold of 10, 494 cells. Um, and 20, we start to see that we're losing them. But something that I hope is kind of interesting is that the actual contours of the cells are identical. 
Um, because as I was developing it, I tried to think about what these parameters meant and to try and make them much more stable than other al algorithms could be. So you can adjust the intensity threshold and it doesn't change the size of things. It might change the numbers because it throws out dark stuff, but it doesn't change the size because of the way it defines the boundary based upon the second derivative and stuff like that. So there's some thinking behind it, but the thinking behind it is driven by um, the real world application. So there's some, we want to continue to be able to do that, to develop algorithms that might look hopefully relatively easy to use in the end, um, but actually have really thought deeply about the problem of trying to solve. Uh, we want to make QFAT simpler from the developer's perspective. So one of the things that I changed in um, the 0.4 release is if you were writing a script in QPath and you wanted to add a new measurement, um, the code on the left is what you used to have to write. And now the code on the right is what you have to write now. It's a lot simpler, it's a lot easier. And so we'll just make it easier um, for people who are happy to write scripts in order to be able to get the results that they want because um, they don't have such a weird way of writing stuff. Um, and similarly, if we want to set cell classifications, previously the code was quite complicated and very QFAT specific, but hopefully on the right, it's a lot more readable and easier for people to do. And what this means in practice is, let's suppose we have an image here, and if I want to get some kind of first pass analysis of it, um, we have the tools in QPath to visualize the channels, for example, but if I'm happy to, to write code, write a script, this is a script that only has 15 meaningful lines of code, because a lot of the work is done by QPath in the background. But I can run this and it will call, detect the cells, classify the cells um, based on measurements for each channel, and then um, look at the distances between them, calculate a kind of triangulation. And I'm not saying this is necessarily going to be the best results for it, but the fact that it can be got in such a small amount of code, it gives you the first results quickly, so it gives more time to focus on validation, refinement, and deeper exploration of the stuff that's really hard. So the goal here is that we want a QPath to make it to make the stuff that should be easy easy, so that you can focus effort um, on the things that are actually hard. Um, another thing, um, well, come to an end. Uh, another thing is uh, from a developer perspective is how can we process huge images. So this was something that I wanted to squeeze into the uh, a couple of a um, couple of weeks ago. So I was working on it. Is how when you have a huge image and you want to say detect something in it, you need to break it into small manageable parts. The trouble is how do you deal with the boundaries? So if you've broken your image into little bits and you detect something at the boundary, well, how do you know when to merge them together? And that's something that doesn't really have a general purpose solution that I know of. There's no obvious way of doing that. And that was one reason why if you wanted to develop a new algorithm in QPath, you would it would be hard, or if you want to develop it in Python or anywhere else, because you have to resolve these problems all over again. So I created this thing um, called a object merger. So here is an example. So um, some detected cells, and you might be able to see that they are broken along these lines that appear. So these are the tile boundaries. And so I created a new kind of class, which gives you some different criteria to be able to figure out automatically when they should be merged together. And so this is it before, and this is it afterwards. And so this may seem like a small thing, but it's something I'm quite excited about because it makes it so much easier to introduce new algorithms into QPath. And by making it easier to introduce new algorithms, it's easier to solve a wider range of problems a lot more quickly. And this is the code that you have to write in order to be able to, to merge at the moment. And this could be built into commands as well. And so you have to write very little because there's the problem is basically solved um, within the main QPath code base line. Another thing that I've been working on then is the ability to have a new kind of pixel processor so that links up with the merging so you can break up um, your image into tiles and you write a tiny little function or as big or as complicated as you want to actually process the tile. And then QPath is able to run it in parallel across your image, figure out how to merge everything together. And so that's what we've seen here. I wrote a, a little function, and actually in this case, I'm using image J, I don't have to, um, but QPath will do all of the hard work in order to be able to break up the image into tiles, convert it to an image J friendly format, send it to the function, you do all the local processing, and then QPath will figure out how to piece it all together. And so this makes it so much easier to be able to develop new algorithms. You can adapt this to subcellular detection, you can use it to make custom measurements for objects and so on. Um, and so then to end, uh, QPath isn't really the right tool for everything. Um, 
I still regularly use ImageJ and Fiji and Python myself to prototype and try new algorithms. And so one thing that I want to be able to do is to make QPath easy to link up with these. And so this is a project that for an embarrassing long period of time, I've been mentioning it exists and yet still haven't released it in part because I don't have the capacity to answer questions about it because there could be too many to deal with and I need to find time to clean up the code. But basically, um, this may be of interest for people who use Python. We have QPath here, um, a Jupyter Notebook running regular Python, but we're able to exchange data between them. And so basically, QPath can be like a whole slide viewer associated with Python, but we can write in our Jupyter Notebook, we can create screenshots of it, we can embed them, we can request objects from QPath, pull them into Python, start to interrogate them, manipulate them, um, change them there, um, make measurements, send that back to QPath, and so on. And so the goal here is that Jupyter Notebooks and Python are really popular um, for data scientists, and we want it to be easy for them to use the tools that they are comfortable with in order to be able to do analysis, which is QPath compatible um, without relying on purely Python tools, which is quite hard. It uses task arrays if you care about that kind of thing. So it um, works in quite a satisfying way if you like coding in Python. Yeah. And I have also then opened up Napari, which is a Python based whole side viewer, um, but as I see reading the pixels from QPath. And so, yeah. I think a lot can potentially be done with this. Finally, then, um, if you would like to help in some way, there's a slide on that. First thing is, I think I would ask everybody to do is to cite the, the correct paper. Um, yeah, uh, if you want to find out more about why I specified the correct paper, you can. Anyway, you should look on the citing page anyway, because that will point you to the paper I would like you to cite. Um, but you can find out why I specified the correct one below if you want to explore that. Um, yeah, so there is an incorrect paper that I would like people not to cite. Um, and our goal is that there will be a new citation because QPath has come along a lot in the last um, six, five or six years. And so um, as, as a group, we want to publish a new paper, but we have not started that, so that's not imminent. Um, but at some point, we definitely need to have a new paper, and then the citation will be updated. So if you use QPath and you want to cite it, then please do check this at the last at the last stage to find out what the current citation is. Um, I would ask you to share ideas and data. So QPath is open source. We want things to be open and shared. And whenever we develop new methods, we do it using open data. Um, I think it might drive people in my group not sometimes that I'm very keen to make sure that we try and do everything right and we don't use data to develop methods that we there could be any issues or complications with. So we try and look and make sure the license of the data are consistent with QPath because it is quite a big project, no? It's used by a lot of people and I want to keep things right. Um, and so by sharing data freely, then it becomes available for people doing open source projects to be able to use them. Um, and so that really helps. And one thing that helps enormously is answering user questions. I it makes me very happy to see on the forum um, people answering questions who, yeah, people who aren't me. So in the early days, I was answering many, many questions, and I absolutely could not sustain that over the years. Um, but what has been exciting is to see that the people whose questions I was initially answering are now answering more people's questions. And then the ones whose questions they're answering are starting to answer more questions, and that becomes really, really satisfying and exciting. If you're nervous about it, then just uh, it may be slightly reassuring that I don't really mind if the answers are right, because my answers aren't always right. And I read other people's answers on QPath and I think, well, I had totally misunderstood the question. I, um, I wouldn't have thought of that. So I think the willingness to answer and engage is really valuable. And I think it's a really good way to learn as well. So I would encourage you um, to look at the forum and post questions if you're comfortable with it, but also answer questions. Give it a go. If you're wrong, I'm sure someone will correct you, and I hope you don't mind that. And then you can correct other people whenever they're wrong. Um, and people correct me because I get them wrong as well. Uh, so yeah, I would definitely encourage you um, to to participate in the forum, both to ask and to answer questions. Um, could potentially collaborate. Uh, we have very limited capacity, and I yeah don't necessarily solve problems as quickly as 
collaborators might like, um, but our software is going to be steered by that. Um, the tools we develop depend upon the research collaborations that we're working on because we don't want to develop something that we think solves a problem. We want to work on trying to solve the problem and make sure that it does. And so collaboration could be a possibility, um, but I also want to be very sure that we put we focus on things which are open access and open source compatible. And so I tend to not collaborate in projects where the data can't be shared widely afterwards because we want to make sure that as far as possible, whenever we develop a method, we make it as open as possible and then other people can then develop a better method. And um, actually that's a good thing. And one way to contribute, um, you might think that for an open source project, the best way to contribute is by writing code. And I don't want to say it too brutally, um, but yeah. Um, Reviewing code's not a lot of fun. Um, increasingly, I, I don't have a lot of time to work on the code, but it's the really fun bit. Um, and it's often faster to write code than to review code from other people because they might be thinking on their project, but I need to, we need to think about the bigger project and the thousands of people. So it's great to discuss with people about the code ideas, but they encourage code to be developed through extensions. Um, and if QBAF doesn't support the extension that you want, then we can discuss and then maybe figure out if we can wait and make it possible. Um, but if lots of people start contributing to QPAP itself, um, then it risks maybe being a bit sort of confused because everybody has different needs. And so, yeah, we can definitely discuss code contributions if you want to make them, um, but I would encourage um, con contributions through extensions and through answering user questions and collaborating, sharing data. Um, those are often easier ways to contribute to the project for which we are very grateful. Um, and finally, please tell us if QPath helps you to do something good, because the whole thing was incredibly difficult in sometimes stupid ways to get to this point. Um, but the whole thing is costly and exhausting, but it only has a purpose through the things that you do with it, because there's absolutely no point in us developing this software and no one does anything with it. Um, and yeah, in and of itself, it doesn't really have any value. It's always through the things that people do with it. And the things that people do with it are things that we could never do with it because we don't understand um, the applications well enough ourselves. Um, and so, yeah, if you do something exciting with it, just tell us. Um, it's encouraging to keep going with it. And it, yeah, it's, Satisfying to hear. Uh, apart from that, I just want to thank you for staying this long. Um, yeah, I uh, also want to thank the people in my group, uh, particularly Fiona and Thibaut, who are here. And you will um, hear more from Thibaut uh, in the next next couple of days. Um, Melvin, who you had joined before, in Bond in particular, who is also here um, and gets a special mention uh, as having put up with me over the years talking about it incessantly complaining about the situations around it and stuff like that and so she yeah it wouldn't really exist without her support um and then z and sarah and, and michael for all that they have done in helping to teach it and arranging this now for the third time uh so yeah i think that's all i have to say <laughs>